Please be seated. Amen. Thank you, Brother Gary, for filling in for Micah. They should be traveling back here in the next day or so, so be praying for him and Naomi and the girls. This morning we're going to be in Isaiah 44, if you want to start turning there. <clears throat> this last Friday we took our youth uh, bowling for our annual back-to-school lock-in. Always enjoy spending that time with the youth. I always enjoy showing them up on the bowling lanes and uh, showing them how to really do it, you know, and uh, we had a good time, but uh, this year was a little bit painful for me. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I guess, learning that I can't really keep up with the kids as well as I used to, so, you know, I used to imagine myself to be somewhat of a pretty decent bowler. I've got a nice curve ball. I, I have my form where I slide on the floor and look like a professional at least in my mind, that's what I, I thought about myself. So, okay, going to show the kids how to do it. First frame, first throw, I go up and I do my, my, my normal deal and I don't see it and the floor looks good, it looks polished, looks like you're going to slide just fine on it. What I don't see is a dry spot on the floor. My foot happens to find that dry spot on my last step and it just sticks hard. The problem is the rest of my body doesn't stick hard. It just keeps on going. And I fall over flat on my face in front of all of my teenagers who were very gracious to not laugh at me. Or at least not that I heard. It was kind of loud in there. Maybe I'll laugh. I don't know. Uh, and it was a really goofy fall because, you know, you're trying not to fall. And so I did anything but graceful uh, with that fall as I'm stumbling and falling like slow motion and then just bam, just hit hard on the bowling alley floor. And I don't know what hurt worse, my knees that took the brunt of the impact, my back that twisted severely, or my pride for looking so foolishly in front of my youth. I, I'm really not sure. The, you know, as I was looking at it, Sherilyn always says, you need to check the floor before you try to do that crazy stuff. And I'm always, ah, yeah, whatever. The floor looked fine for me, but, um, you know, little did I know it was going to cause quite literally my, my fall. And uh, this morning we're going to be talking about sin. We're going to continue to talk about the nature of sin. And, and this morning we're going to take some time to, to reflect on the, the disgrace and the deception of sin. Uh, because sin, while it looks fine oftentimes, even looks inviting oftentimes, causes our downfall when we take that last step. And it's only when we remember these elements of sin, its disgrace and its deception, that we can rejoice, truly rejoice in its death. So as we prepare to read the Lord's Word, I ask you to pray with me and we'll seek His favor in this time. Lord God, as we have reflected on the victory that you have won through Christ crucified, as we reflect on the price that was paid on the tomb in which our Lord was laid, and as we reflect on the victory on the first day of the week, we do rejoice and shout glory to God Most High, for you have accomplished the impossible and you have saved a sinner like me. I thank you, Lord God. And I pray as your people gather together now, as we quiet our hearts and our minds to hear your word, that you would speak to us and that we would be open to hearing your voice. Lord, I ask for eyes that are open to see and ears that are open to hear and hearts that are ready to respond with belief to your word. Please, Lord, speak life into us now for your glory and for our good. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 44, we uh, have been looking particularly at a courtroom scene as God has been dealing with the nations and with his people going back and forth. You call your witness, here is my witness, here is my defense, what's your defense? Going back and forth and, and today we're going to look at the foolishness of the nations who turn to foreign gods and Isaiah particularly Chapters 40 through 66 have this continued theme of looking at the foolishness 
of idolatry. And this is one of the key sections in Isaiah's prophecy as God through the prophet truly mocks the idol and the idolater. And through this we see really the effects of sin upon the hearts of man. So I want us to begin reading in verse 9 of chapter 44, if you'll read along with me. It says, Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile, and their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know so that they will be put to shame. Who has fashioned a God or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be put to shame, for the craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let all assemble themselves, let them stand up, let them tremble, let them together be put to shame. The man shapes iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arm. He also gets hungry and his strength fails and he drinks no water and becomes weary. Last week we ended with a very strong testimony as God called Israel to be his witness to confirm what's true about who the Lord God is. Israel had seen God's power, experienced God's deliverance, had known the power and majesty of Almighty God, that he alone is God, that he alone is Savior, that he alone is the rock. There is no one else. And so God, having called Israel to be his witnesses to this fact, now addresses the nations who have turned to idols to be their witnesses. And we've seen how God has shown how idols are, are, are dumb, deaf, mute, can't speak, can't hear, can't act, can't do anything because there's no life in them. Humanity turns to lifeless things to save them from the living God, and that is absolute foolishness. So God now turns to the idolater and he says, uh, who is this who's fashioned a God or cast an idol to no profit? Who is the fool who would be willing to work and to strive to form and fashion something that can't help them in any way? It's a worthless task, a meaningless pursuit, a futile goal that humanity has set for themselves. But there's a word I want to focus on as we start and that is the word fashion. Verse 9, uh, and a few times in our passage this morning, who, those who fashion a graven image. This word fashion, it means to form or to make something into whatever you want it to be. It's used all throughout Scripture for several different people and things and situations. But specifically for our purpose, it's used of God's creative work. It's used particularly of God creating or fashioning light, fashioning different animals and, and different people groups. It's used of God fashioning Israel as a nation, but I think most significantly for our text, it's used in Genesis 2 of God fashioning humanity, Adam and Eve, in His image. God creates the heavens and the earth, but in chapter 2 of Genesis, it tells us that God gets a little closer and more intimate in the creation of humanity. It's not merely a speaking into existence that happens with Adam and Eve, but God actually comes and fashions and forms man in his image. And Isaiah uses this word here for these idolaters who are fashioning graven images, as we'll see in verse 13 in a moment, in their own image. And so here's the picture that you have. You have God who, who fashions man in his image. Mankind is supposed to bear the glory of God throughout all of creation as the image bears. That is our purpose. That is why we exist. This grand, noble purpose that God has given us. And then you have the idolater. You have the human who has decided to step down and fashion something in their own image to fashion a God that they can serve, that they can turn to. Now here's the absolute insanity of this. The thing fashioned is always lesser than the one who does the fashioning. The thing created is always lesser than the one who creates. And so if the character of the fashioner is one of weakness and folly, 
What does that say about what is fashioned or made? Let's look at the nature of the idolater. It says that their witnesses, these idols that they make, they fail to see. Verse 9, they fail to know so that they will be put to shame. He says that the companions of the idolaters and the idolaters themselves will all be put to shame because this is what they're doing. Man takes an iron, shapes iron into a cutting tool. He begins to fashion and form his iron into the idol that he wants to worship. And it says he gets hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and he becomes weary. So the one who is fashioning is weak. The one who is fashioning gets tired, wears out. He doesn't drink the water necessary to keep him refreshed and he begins to grow weary in his effort to create something that will supposedly deliver him. So the fashioner is weak and weary, which means that the thing fashioned is going to be even more worthless. God says, who on earth would do that? I mean, that is a stupid thing to do. It's a foolish pursuit. Who would do that? And he looks at the nations and he says, you would do that. Not only are you worthless, but let's look at what you create. Verse 13, another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of a man, so that it may sit in a house. Surely he cuts cedars for himself and, and for himself, and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he, he takes one of them and he warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat as, as a roast to roast and he's satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Aha, I'm warm. I have seen the fire. But the rest of it he makes into a god. His graven image. He falls down before it and worship. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me. For you are my God. Even some of the ancient writers would mock the insanity of the practice of idolatry, even though they would participate in it. And, and just so we're clear, uh, in their strong philosophy and theology, those who really knew what they were talking about, the idols weren't seen as gods in themselves. They were vehicles for the gods. And so a lot of people look at Isaiah and they say, oh, he's mocking them. That's not what people really do. That's not what they really did. But the reality is while the philosophers may have seen idols as just a vehicle for the God, the common man saw the idol as the God. The common man feared the idol. The common man trusted in the idol. The common man thought that this block of wood or this piece of stone or this piece of metal would actually somehow be able to deliver them. This is what... The majority of people in the ancient world thought of when they thought of idols, a God who could save them. And Isaiah looks at this, uh, God speaking through Isaiah looks at this and says, how crazy is that? So let me get this straight. You plant a tree and you nourish the tree and you raise the tree up until it's big enough for you to go at it with your axe. In this tree that you chop down with your axe, you put into the fire. And it makes you warm. And you cook your food over the fire that is burning because of this tree that you grew up and chopped down and threw into the fire pit. And then you decided to take the rest of that tree that could not grow itself because it needed you, that could not stop your axe from chopping it down, that could not keep itself from being thrown into your fire, and somehow the rest of that tree becomes your God that you bow down to and say, save me. If it can't save itself from your axe, how do you expect it to save you from anything? 
This is nothing less than disgraceful for a man to bow down to a block of wood and say, save me. And God says, absolutely, that's a disgrace. This is the sin of idolatry. And we may not bow down to blocks of wood, but I want us to stop and reflect for a moment on what this is saying particularly about sin in general. There's a lot of definitions we can have for sin, but there's one perspective of sin that I think we need to think about this morning, and that is the idea that sin itself is the act of surrendering your will to a lesser being. Think about it. Adam and Eve in the garden, whenever they sinned, when Eve took and she ate, she surrendered her will to the serpent. Now, the serpent was more crafty than all the beasts that the Lord God had made, but the serpent was less than God. The serpent was made by God. And so she surrendered her will to something less than God and committed transgression against the Almighty. Adam surrendered his will to his wife, somebody less than God, and committed sin and condemned the rest of us to eternal hell. We, when we sin decide to take God off the throne and place someone or something that is less than God on the throne and bow down and say, you save me. We may not bow down to a block of wood, but humanity is still an idolatrous people because we bow down to things less than God. Now, here's the thing. God has created you to bear his image and to spread his glory and his fame throughout all of creation. Rule and subdue the earth is the commandment. We are the image bearers of God. There is no grander, greater, glorious purpose than what God has given us to do. And it's disgraceful to the meaning and value that God has given us when we bow down to something less than God. Sin is a horrible thing that brings death absolutely. Sin is an affront to God, a burden that God will remove through death absolutely. But we need to also understand that sin is disgraceful and shameful for the sinner. That when you commit sin, it's not just that it's a burden on God that you're going to have to deal with. It's not just that it can affect people in your life who are going to be damaged by your sinfulness or selfishness. But it's that sin takes the beautiful image of God in which you have been made and mars and corrupts and perverts and distorts and brings shame upon you, the sinner. God has created us. Far more than the pursuits of this life. And yet we get so caught up in Jesus tells a parable about this in Luke 12. He talks about this guy who you know, plants and, and, and he waters and grows and he produces a, a, just a tremendous harvest. And he says, this is great. This is my retirement plan. I'm going to tear down my old barn and build a bigger one. And I'm going to be at rest. I'm going to be able to just to enjoy the rest of my life. And Jesus says in this parable, God comes to him that night and he says, you fool. He says, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? It's not that the preparation was bad. It's not that your retirement plans are bad. But listen to me. God has created you for a far greater purpose than the pursuit of money. He has created you for a far greater purpose than the pursuit of a career, than the family relationships or the relationships that you desire. He has created you for a far greater purpose than all of these things. And when we choose to displace God's purpose to pursue these other purposes, we bring shame and disgrace upon ourselves as those made in the image of God. And it's not that money and careers and relationships and all that stuff's bad. There's nothing wrong with those things. Just like there's nothing wrong with this tree. I mean, the guy made the tree grow. He nurtured it, brought it up. There's nothing wrong with the tree. He cuts it down. That's what he's supposed to do. He chops it up. He puts it in the fire. He uses it to warm himself. Uses it to cook his food. Nothing wrong with the tree. Nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with careers. Nothing wrong with family. Nothing wrong with hobbies. Nothing wrong with these things. Until we take these things 
and make them displace God in our life. It becomes sin when the tree becomes our God. And God becomes something less in our heart. And when you do that, of all the other things that you do, of all the other effects that it has on God, on the world around you, on the people around you, most of all, it brings shame to you who are made to bear God's glory to the nations. But it's hard to see. I mean, it's real easy to get caught up in the pursuits of this world. It's real easy to think, well, God's okay with this if I just... It's real hard to see the disgrace that sin brings because sin also brings a deceptive blindness. Let's keep reading verse 18. So he's bowed down to a block of wood saying, Deliver me, for you are my God. He says in verse 18, They do not know, nor do they understand. For he has smeared over their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot comprehend. No one recalls, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire and also have baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it. Then I make the rest of it into an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. He, speaking of the idolater, feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside and he cannot deliver himself, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? We've already seen in Isaiah 29 of God speaking about pouring a deep uh, spirit, uh, a spirit of deep sleep over the people, blinding them, causing them to not see. Isaiah 6, Isaiah's call, commission to Israel. I want you to go. I want you to preach in such a way that they won't see, that they won't hear, that they won't believe, because if they did, they repent, would repent and be healed, and I don't want to do that. So Isaiah's commission is to cause them to not see and to not hear. Here says that God takes the idolater and he smears over their eyes so that they can't see the foolishness of their choices. They can't see that the idol that they can hold in their right hand is nothing but a lie. Now I want you to understand this isn't simply God being unfair. God acts in kind with us. People reject God, and God hands them over to the foolishness of their sin and to the blinding effect that sin has upon them. If you go over to Romans 1, you can read about how Paul says that while God has made it evident in creation of who He is, of His divine attributes, He has made it very clear in how He has created the universe that He is, there is no other, that mankind has rejected the God of all creation to worship God creation and because they've done that God has handed them over to a depraved mind God has given them over to the blindness that sin brings and so here Isaiah says that God smears their eyes they don't understand they don't know I mean we as Christians we look at the world and we say how can they be so foolish how can they have these pursuits that are so worthless we look at, at, at our nation and see people tearing it apart in absolute wickedness and say how on earth can they not see it I want us to understand, I think God wants us to understand that sin is a blinding agent. That it makes us blind to the point that we are in such a fog that we can't see the truth that is right in front of us. The sinners in this world are that way. That's why they act the way they do. And you think, how could they possibly do that? It's because they're blinded by sin. But my friends, you and I, when we choose sinful paths, become just as blind and just as foolish with our own sins we become just as deceived he says he feeds on ashes verse 20 and to, uh, the word means to graze and so it's kind of like this image of of he's a sheep he's looking for somewhere to eat and he starts eating in this ash field and he doesn't realize that that's all he has is just ashes the bible says that god leads us beside Still waters causes us to lie down in green pastures. That's what God does. So if you want to feed on good stuff, you follow God. But the sinner, he's so blind to it, he goes and he eats ashes. Like, hmm, that's good stuff. He says a, a deceived heart has turned him aside, and he can't deliver himself, and, and he can't even understand that what's in his right hand is a lie. He has been tricked and fooled 
by sin. You know, when I was a kid, uh, my family, we made annual trips to El Paso. That's where my grandparents lived, and uh, we lived in the uh, east side of Dallas. So east side of Dallas all the way to El Paso. Very long road trip. You know, this was before smartphones and TVs in the car and, you know, handheld gain systems and all of that stuff, which meant my sister and I had to find ways to entertain ourselves for the thousands of hours it felt like that we spent traveling, particularly through West Texas. You know, one of the things we do is like the, the license plate game. That's a really slow game when you're driving through West Texas and there's nobody on the road. But there's one thing that always fascinated me as we drive through, and that's the, the mirage is when you, when you look on the Ford on the road and it looks like there's water on the road. You're looking out there, and, you know, I remember when I was a kid, my parents explaining it to me. It just was fascinating to me. It's like, it looks like there's really water there, and then you get there, and there's nothing but more West Texas road. And you're like, oh, come on. I don't want any more of this. But you just keep looking at it. You keep seeing it. And, 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 you know, whenever I was a kid, I was sitting in a car, drink my water bottle. It didn't really matter to me that that was an illusion. I knew it was an illusion. But you take the same person, you put them in the desert, and they have no water, and they're completely thirsty and dying of it and they look at that and even if they know in their mind it's an illusion they don't care they want it to be true and they they chase down this mirage and when they finally get there it, it just vanishes and all they have is just more heat and drought and death and this is exactly what sin is sin is this beautiful picture that's set before us of of pleasure and of security and of joy and of the easy path and it looks like it has something that could quench our thirst. But when we pursue it, we get to it and it vanishes like this water on the road in West Texas. It just goes away and all we have is death. When we fall for the lie, we, we chase it with all we are. When we finally get there, that last step, I finally have it. You find you're tricked and there's nothing but, but death for you. This is what sin is and what sin does. It promises us all of this good stuff. And then you get there and you have nothing. Now, Christian, if you are spiritually healthy, sitting in the car drinking water, you're not going to fall for it. But when you're spiritually dying of thirst because you've forsaken the only source of life and you are just so out of your mind with desire to have your soul quenched and satisfied, you look at it and you say, maybe that can do it. Maybe that can deliver me. Maybe that can save me. So I'm going to go for it. Forget about God. I want that because that can satisfy my soul. And then you find yourself dead in a desert because you fell for a lie. Jesus alone is the living water. He alone is the truth. He alone is the one who can quench your spiritual thirst. Don't fall for the lie that sin is. We need to recognize the disgrace of sin. We need to remember the deception of sin so that we, my friends, can begin to rejoice in its death. Verse 21, Remember these things, O Jacob, in Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I've wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Shout for joy, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout joyfully, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into a shout of joy, you mountains. O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob. And in Israel he, is sh he shows forth his glory. So first we have in verse 21 a call to remember. Remember these things, O Jacob. Remember them, O Israel. There's, there's two things he's wanting them to remember. First of all, what we've just covered. Remember how foolish it is to trust in anything but me. Remember that I alone am the rock, that I am alone in the Savior, and that all these worthless idols you have bowed down to can't deliver you. Remember the deception of sin. Remember the disgrace of sin. Remember these things, O Jacob. And then secondly, remember who you are. 
He says, you are my people. And while those idolaters may form and fashion worthless idols, I have formed you. And while you maybe have forgotten me, I have not forgotten you. God says, remember what's set before you so that you don't fall for the lie of sin. And then he calls them, verse 22, to return. Now we saw last week when uh, uh, over in 43, 25, God says, I wipe out your transgressions uh, that I will do this. We saw last week that that process of wiping out is going to be a painful process for Judah, that there's going to be judgment and, and death and all sorts of things. But here in, in chapter 44, this idea of wiping them out like a, a cloud that God just blows away, he's going to take away the sins of Israel. Here he says, I've already done it. This is a beautiful thing because in, in chapter 43, it's I'm going to do it. It's in the future. You've got it set before you. It's going to be painful, but it is there. Now he's looking back and he's saying, I've already done it. I've already redeemed you. I've already paid the price. Sin has already been dealt with, so come back to me. I've removed the obstacle that keeps you from having life in me, so come back to me. He calls them, as we say, to repent, to turn from their sinful, worthless pursuit and to come home to him. Now, we can look at this biblically in the New Testament and see how God did this. God wiped out our transgressions by taking them and nailing them to the cross. He, he, he caused those, those sins and the guilt to simply be wiped away from us by taking them and placing them on his son Jesus as he hung on Calvary's tree and endured the curse of sin on our behalf. Paul says that Christ put to death our sins in that moment. He's dealt the death blow to sin. He's already done it. So come home. God says, come back to me. And when you do this, you can rejoice. I want you to note in verse 23, this call to rejoice. Heavens, lower parts of the earth, it's like A to Z and everything in between. All of creation, rejoice. And then he goes to the mountains and the forest and every tree. And I think he probably is, is um, again, indicating the foolishness of idolatry. The, the mountains that the idolaters used to worship their false gods on and the trees that they cut down to to fashion their false gods are going to rejoice when God gets rid of those silly idolaters. It's not just that we were made for God's glory. Creation was made for God's glory as well. And we, we bring disgrace to creation when we use it for lesser things. And so he says, all of creation is going to rejoice because I have redeemed my people and shown forth my glory in Israel. When Jesus died on the cross, he took our sins upon himself and he put them to death which means that the sin that brings shame to you and brings condemnation before God has been wiped away and removed. The greatest enemy has been defeated and we as his people should rejoice. But Here's the problem. We have to first of all see sin for what it is and second of all want to be done with it if we're going to find joy. A lot of times people don't find joy in these types of things. I'm not going to hell when I die. Woohoo, that's great. That's what I rejoice in. But to think my sins and the guilt, the weight and the burden of my sins that make me worthy of hell has actually been dealt with. Hallelujah, praise God, because His glory has been manifested throughout all creation through Christ crucified. We don't think in those terms oftentimes because the reality is while we want the guilt to be dealt with, we still like our sins and don't want to be done with those things. It requires to find true joy in God's salvation. It requires seeing sin for what it is and wanting it dead. I know we're saying, told you know you shouldn't hate anything, but the reality is you should hate sin. 
You should hate it with a passion. You should hate it with all that you are. God hates it with a passion. And our passion should be God's passion. And it should be a hatred for the thing that brings disgrace on God's creation. It should be a hatred for the thing that robs God of His glory. Our hatred should be God's and that hatred should be for the sin that consumes our lives and our world around us. But do we hate it? When Jesus calls you to follow him, he bids you come and die. The reality is, is all of us have a part in ourselves that doesn't hate the sin. All of us have a part in ourselves that still wants it. And I can say this with confidence. Even if I don't know you from Adam, I can say this with confidence. Because even the apostle Paul said, wretched man that I am. I do what I don't want to do, and what I want to do, I don't do. And he says, I concur heartily with the law of God, but in my flesh, I see this war raging. So if the apostle Paul still has part of himself that wants sin, I guarantee you and I do as well. We have part of ourselves that love it, which is why we have to die. If sin's going to be put to death, then that part of you that loves it needs to be put to death. And when you see it that way and you begin to pursue it that way, then my friends, you will begin to rejoice as you watch sin die in your life. Jesus has already won the victory. He calls us to live out that victory by dying to ourselves that we might know life in him. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for showing us the disgrace of our sins and the shame that it brings when we engage in these wicked things, when we desire them, when we pursue them. God, I pray that you would grant us eyes that would see and ears that would hear, that you would remove the blindness, that you would remove the deafness, and that you would remove the hardness of heart that we might hate our sin with such a passion that we're willing to do whatever it takes to live in freedom. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the victory. You've already won it. And I pray, Lord Jesus, now for the faith that we might live in your victory. Convict us. Show us those things that we still love and that we need to put to death. Convict us and show us practically how to do that. Show us, Lord God, the right path and give us the faith, the courage, the strength to walk it. I pray most of all that we in our hearts would love you enough to hate our sin with passion. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this morning my question is who are you? Are you the idolater who bows down to a block of wood who disgraces yourself with worthless pursuits? Or are you the believer who sees all of that for what it is and just wants more of Jesus? If you see your sin for what it is, then today my invitation is nothing short of hate your sin and do something about it. Listen, it's not about, you know what, one day I, I really want to get to this problem and, 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 you know, maybe when I retire I'll have time to do that. Or, you know, one day I'd really like to be a good Christian and maybe, maybe at some point I'll get there. It's not about one day, it's about today. Because victory is not about one day, it's about what happened 2,000 years ago. It's already been won, it's already been accomplished, and you have access to that victory now if you are willing today to not harden your heart. Today to respond with belief. If you are willing today to repent and return to the Lord Jesus, you will find joy immeasurable. Sin weighs you down. It deceives you. It corrupts you. It distorts you. It blinds you. Jesus sets you free. I don't know what you need to do to experience that freedom. I don't know what sins you need to deal with. I don't know what decisions you need to make. But as we sing in our song of invitation and go about our day today, I pray that God would open your eyes and that you would respond 
by hating your sin and by chasing the Savior who has freed you from it. I'll be down here to pray with you if you need whatever the Lord lays on your heart. Use this time to find joy in Jesus. Stand with me and let's sing.